Hello, my name is Gavin Henning, professor of higher education at New England College, where I direct a master's program in higher education administration, as well as a doctorate of education program. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about using CAS for equity-driven program review. Let's begin with the learning goals. At the end of this module, you should be able to understand how CAS program review processes can help an organization identify where equity gaps are, and also how CAS program review processes can help leaders understand how to use outcomes-based assessment data to determine if their programs and services are equitably supporting all students. Let's begin with an overview of CAS. CAS was founded in 1979 and is a consortium of now 40 member organizations within higher education. And the council is comprised of representatives from each of these member organizations. And this is helpful to know because when CAS develops standards and practice for functional areas, these standards are approved by all of these member organizations through a consensus building process and including experts um, in those specific fields. So when CAS approves a set of standards, it's really approved by the field for the field. Currently, we have 47 sets of functional area standards. So these are for specific departments or units, such as housing, residence life, campus police, student activities, those types of areas. We also have self-assessment guides for each of those. And these self-assessment guides are worksheets really for the self-assessment process. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We also have three cross-functional frameworks. And cross-functional frameworks are a little bit different than functional area standards. The frameworks really help address issues that transcend any one, um, any one functional area. For example, we have a functional area framework or cross-functional framework on first-year experiences. So typically they're not an office for first-year experience, but uh, many offices come together to work on that. We have another uh, cross-functional framework on addressing high-risk behavior, um, which we call advancing um, health and well-being. And so again, that the functional area framework really addresses how multiple units can work together to address that issue. And CAS isn't just a set of standards or a practice, but actually there's a program review process. So it's both the standards and a process, which I'll talk about in a little bit. There are five principles underlying all CAS standards. First is this idea of students and their environments. Really, how do we create environments that support student learning and development and success? And really assess if that's happening. How programs and services can advocate for diverse, equitable, inclusive communities. And there's one section that's set aside for addressing, looking at how to do that. What is that organization leadership and human resource portion of a uh, program or a service to look at? You know, what does that function area need to do around leadership, management, supervision, collaboration, and human resources? What are the ethical considerations specific to that functional area? And then how do those functional areas create the systems and the infrastructure really to support the programs and services for students? And what are the finances that are needed? What te technology is needed? What does that infrastructure and facilities look like? And CAS has what we call general standards. And general standards serve two purposes. The first is actually these are the main sections for functional area standards. The cross-functional frameworks have a different structure, um, but every functional area framework has these 12 sections. And then each of these sections have a set of standards. So really the CAS standards is a, for each functional area, there are a set of multiple standards. And so these are the, the most recent version that we just launched in 2019 of those general standard areas. And then again, um, more specifically, general standards are standards that are common across all functional areas. It doesn't matter what the functional area is, um, these set standards go through every single one of them. We call them the boilerplate. So an example is down below at this slide. The functional area must develop and define its mission. It doesn't matter if that's career services, it doesn't matter if that is assessment programs, that doesn't matter if it's TRIO programs. Regardless of the functional area, that area should de um, develop and define its mission. And then within those 12 sections, in addition to the general standards, we have functional area standards which are specific to that functional area. And here's an example of a mission-related um, functional area standard um, for career services. And so sets of standards have both these general standards and these functional area standards. CAS also has a set of uh, learning and development outcomes. And so not, our, not only are CAS standards for professional practice, but really about um, outcomes for students. And what should they be developing? 
And we call these um, the, the CAS out the domains. And these are part of the CAS general standards. And we expect that functional areas think about which of the outcomes, which of these domains do they support? And there's actually more specific dimensions within each of these domains, which you can find on the CAS website. So it's important to know that CAS is about practice, but also fostering student learning and development. So let's now talk a little bit about how CAS can be used for addressing equity. The first way is actually taking a look at the standards and seeing how CAS addresses equity within the standards themselves. First, taking a look at student learning. There's a, a domain for human, humanitarianism and civic engagement. And then within that is a dimension for understanding and appreciation of cultural and human differences. So it's important to CAS that really we think about these differences, appreciate them and understand them, because that's essential for students, for students and students learning. And then as part of this, um, as part of the general standards, programs and services should be thinking about how do they address um, the specific learning outcome dimension. Within the assessment standard, there are multiple places where equity is built in. First, this idea about using universal design. So assessment processes should employ universal design, using multiple ways to gather data, um, to interpret data. Assessment also must be implemented in a way that's culturally responsive, inclusive, and equitable. There's a lot of emerging uh, literature right now on this idea of culturally responsive social justice assessment, and assessment should be done in that way. There also should be multiple methods of collecting data. And this really helps ensure that there's a fuller picture, a more inclusive, equitable picture of what's going on um, for the student experience and student learning. And we also recommend disaggregating data. It's, it's critical and it's, it's really vital for a program or service to disaggregate any outcome data to understand how the outcomes or how the student experience is different depending on what um, demographics um, group a student may be in. So we really need to under, understand those differences to really do a good job making sure that all students are being served. Of course, there's the access, equity, diversity, and inclusion standard. There are multiple areas within this standard where equity is addressed. First, it's really about the organization. And so CAS standards say that uh, uh, programs and services should provide equitable access to that program or service. Um, they should be, be responding to the needs of all their constituents, not just the majority of constituents. And they should be addressing actions, policies, and structures that perpetuate systems of power and privilege. And this is a new addition. So not only is CAS talking about access, but really talking about changing those systems that undergird our bias, um, our biases and our assumptions and the, the, the structures within higher education that cause um, this cause these biases. There's also a section of advocating. So CAS um, says that that program and services must advocate for access to facilities and resources, which is a reiteration of what we mentioned on the previous slide. Advocating for inclusion, both for culturalism and social justice, and acting culturally responsive, inclusive, respectful, and equitable practices, and making sure that the, the staff in that area are also developing the cultural competence. So really thinking about how that, that program or service not only thinks about and applies the um, equity within their organizational structure, but how do they advocate this, play, take a very um, proactive role. And then also CAS talks about in the implementation of those specific programs and services, there are some things they need to be thinking about in those, in those areas. So there should be goals for access to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and then strategies built to achieve those goals. Making sure that the, um, the diverse constituents are being addressed, their needs are being addressed. So looking at everybody, what their dif differential needs are. Ensuring that personnel have the, the training to, to work with diverse students and diverse groups. And having pers uh, personnel really cultivate this understanding, the importance of understanding identity, culture, self-expression, self and heritage. Not just tolerance, but celebrating that and understanding how that's beneficial to the educational mission of the institution. It's also important for personnel to promote promote respect. And so this really helps create civil environments, and really helps students learn about those differences. And obviously there should be processes for when biases incidents do occur. How, do, how are those addressed? And then a proactive interactive experience or process for addressing accommodations. So if students um, with disabilities need accommodations, that process should be interactive with all the um, 
all the, the important constituents, not just something that is determined by the administrator. In the leadership management and supervision standard, there's also this area about advancing diversity, equity, and access. So really it reiterates what we've seen in the other standard areas. And we also see this, this um, allusion to universal design principles in, in the facilities and infrastructure standard. And the focus is really about on universal design for access, um, but I think what's really embedded within the CAS standards is using universal design for learning principles, which are a little bit broader. They're built on the universal design for access principles, but really take a look at the entire learning experience and thinking about how do we provide universal access to all students, not just in terms of accessibility into, into facilities, but the learning experience itself. CAS also addresses equity through the program review process itself. So let's take a look at the program review process. There are seven steps in the CAS program review process. And these really mirror what happens in the academic program review process. The first step is really just outlining the process itself. What does that look like? What are the reasons for doing a self-assessment? How does this connect with other institutional um, assessment processes? What does that timeline look like? The next step is who should be on the team? Um, who are the members? Um, how many should there be? How big should it be? Whose voices should be included? So decisions around that is the second step. And then once the, the process is planned and the team is built, gathering the evidence. What evidence will be needed to make the ratings of the standards? And then the next step is actually using that evidence for those ratings. Um, and the self-assessment guide, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, provides a worksheet, a framework for doing that. Now once the ratings are done, and really the analysis of what's working and what areas need improvement, there needs to be an action plan for addressing those areas, um, those opportunities for improvement. So that the next step is building that action plan. And once the action plan is, is developed, then the final report's pulled together that summarizes the ratings, identifies all the strategies within the action plan, and then is disseminated to appropriate constituencies. And then last time, but not least, is the next step, which in the circular process is making those improvements. So really thinking through well, what are the resources for doing that? How are those improvements made? What's the timeline for those improvements? Is all is not going to happen within three, six months, or even a year? And who is responsible to, to oversee those improvements and really guide that process? And then the self-assessment process starts all over again. The self-assessment guides are multiple uh, are worksheets with multiple pages to help walk through the self-assessment process. The first few pages of the self-assessment guide actually um, describe the self-assessment process and provide some tips for doing that. And then are the worksheets for the ratings themselves. And this is just one example. And so this is the assessment example. And what it does, it breaks down those individual standards and clusters them into groups. And for each of these clusters, there are suggestions for what that evidence is. So it's really helpful to take a look at these self-assessment guides in the evidence gathering stage, because there's some um, fantastic examples of things that really pull from to use for evidence. Once that evidence is collected and the rating process um, comes together, those clusters of standards, in this case for establishing a cluster of assessment, there are three individual standards that are clustered together. This really makes the process of ratings a lot easier. Um, if somebody were to do ratings on every um, individual bullet point or really those standard, that would take a while because they're usually about 250-ish um, individual standards within a set of standards for a functional area. The scale is pretty basic. Um, we have do not apply, so there might be some things given the, the type of institution where that, um, those standards don't apply. Maybe there's not enough evidence. The standard is not met. It's partially met or it meets. And really that's the goal is just meeting the standard. We're not looking at exceeding because the goal is to really just making sure that these standards are addressed. Box for that rating. And then underneath is a space to actually write what the, the, the explanation or the justification for the ratings. So when you go back and if it's not meets or does not meet or partly meets, it's helpful to know why is that? You know, where is that gap? Because that's gonna be needed to develop the action plan. Other areas where equity is addressed in the program review process. Well, first we really um, suggest that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a lens to this entire process. Really thinking about how do we ensure and, um, that we're addressing the needs of all students. And if we use that lens, 
And that can be built into each of those steps of that programming process. So the most important is really including diverse perspectives and diverse voices. So thinking about when you develop the process, where are the places in the process or in that timeline or in the sketch of all of the, the steps in that process where you can include diverse perspectives? For example, the team. How do we ensure diverse perspectives are on the team? We could be looking at diverse perspectives in regard to, um, to social identity, role in the organization, you know, make sure you have an administrative assistant involved, make sure there's a student involved in that process. Um, you may even want an outside community member or somebody outside that functional area, maybe even a faculty member. If it's important or if that functional area collaborates with faculty. How do you, just think about how to pull in diverse perspectives. And then regarding the ratings and the evidence, what are the diverse types of evidence that we need? Do we want, we want some qualitative evidence? We want some quantitative evidence. Making sure if we're doing surveys, we're looking at the data for all the constituent groups so that when we do that, those ratings, we're taking a look at and building in evidence from multiple perspectives. This is where that multiple methods is really important because the more data we can get, the data from more people will give us a fuller perspective on how well a program or service is meeting the needs of all students. As we mentioned earlier in the assessment and standard, just aggregating that data, taking a look at the results for different um, demographic groups to find out, are the experiences different? Are the outcomes different for different groups? Because if so, then some action steps are needed to address that. And also including users in the review. That's why it's really helpful to get students involved or even other people outside of that functional area that use that um, that use that service. Um, for example, um, Campus Union. You may want to involve all the different people who use that unit. Could be community members. It could be the, the conference center that collaborates with the Campus Union to use the space. Because um, when you involve users in that process, that's when you bring in those important voices. Um, those users can both help you identify the evidence that needed, and they're really helpful in the interpretation of what's going on and, and the, the ratings of the evidence. So include them throughout the whole process. Also include them for the, the action planning. They're the ones that can give some great tips for how to make change. And as we wrap up, it's really important to think about the CAS standards as both a set of standards and the program review process. It can be used for an equitable program review um, to help ensure that programs and services are equitable, inclusive, and meeting all the needs of students, and also ensuring that the student learning and either, any other outcomes are equal for everybody everybody's getting what the best thing that can get out of it. We have a lot of CAS information and resources, so if you want to little, learn a little bit more, we've got user groups on Facebook for people who work at or are at two-year institutions and four-year institutions. We post a lot of information, particularly new resources on our Facebook page, as well as Twitter. We also have a YouTube channel where we upload different um, resources workshops that you might want to check out as well. For more information, you can always go to cast.edu. We've got lots of resources there, as well as a link to our store, um, where more resource, resources can be purchased. And for campuses that are um, campus lab users, you can also access the, the functional area standards and cross-functional frameworks through the campus labs um, platform. So if you have any questions, please check us out. And hopefully at this, this module, I'm using CAST for make sure you have equitable program review process is helpful. Take care.